<laughs> All right, it looks like we're ready to get started here today. On behalf of uh, Freight Waves and our partners, Nodal Exchange and DAT, and our sponsors at K-Ratio, I'd like to welcome you to uh, Trucking Freight Futures. Um, before I get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, myself, if I might. Uh, I have a little over 30 years in the trucking industry, touched everything from LTL through ocean freight, air cargo, warehousing, distribution, asset-based, brokerage-based, everything except running a railroad. And over the years managed many large uh, purchase transportation budgets, hundreds of millions of dollars. And very difficult to set that budget looking at previous trends, uh, trends of data, years of data, the cyclical nature of it, looking at what the experts were going to say was happening over the next year, looking at our own customer base, our sales forecasts, etc. Trying to set that budget was extremely difficult. And then holding to that budget throughout the year was a roller coaster ride. Freight markets pick up, trucks are moving, prices skyrocket, it starts to soften, rates start to come down, not only just through the yearly cycle, but cycles throughout the week where sometimes that chart upside down looks a lot better than it does right side up and hoping that at the end, the windfalls outweighed those points where the costs were so high that you couldn't keep in your budget. I always had good excuses at the end for why it happened and everybody understood it. It's very hard to predict and there's no way to really de-risk that or flatten that out. You ride the wave, you try and pick, you try and read the tea leaves as it were. Hopefully your finger was wet enough and the wind was going in the right air, went in the right direction when you set your budget uh, and you rode with it. So when I got a chance to join Freight Waves a little over two years ago when Craig Fuller was telling me what his ideas were here with Freight Futures <coughs> and also Sonar, their data platform, uh, the freight market data platform, to provide transparency to this industry and to provide the tools to de-risk those uh, volatile movements in truckload pricing, I jumped at the chance. And then meeting the team that he was building uh, was humbling. I had a lot of experience, but meeting these C-level folks with years of experience in logistics and the finance world, uh, data scientists, et cetera, that he was, he, was, he was bringing together this incredible tribal knowledge that all were experiencing the same things that I did was, was amazing. That was, that was the, yeah, I am definitely on board to bring the tools that all of us in previous lives would have killed to have to manage those budgets, quite frankly. So let's talk about market sizes and what makes a successful market. So we have three very large markets that have come on board over several decades past. Oil, obviously, 421 billion. Uh, natural gas at 138 billion. Electricity futures, 390 billion. Massive markets, but that's not all it takes. They're also extremely integral to the industry to industry and our economy. They're also highly volatile. They've all had their, their moments that caused the demand for de-risk and the volatile nature in their pricing, uh, like the OPEC moment for oil. In the early 80s, OPEC nations decided they're gonna control the flow of oil and cause the volatility and cause the demand for futures, the ability to de-risk against the volatile nature in that pricing. The key markets are massive, they're integral, and there's the demand, they're highly volatile, and there's demand because they're integral to have some type of tool to de-risk. So let me show you a bigger market. Trucking, 726 billion, 30% larger than pet coke and refined petroleum. Larger than ag and electric power combined, and two times larger than electric, 726 billion. Oil trades in the $35 trillion market, or range, I should say, notional value. Natural gas, 4.7 trillion. Electricity, 212 billion. 
at 726 billion, 30% larger than oil with its integral nature in the economy and its volatility, where are freight futures going to trade? The key takeaway from this slide here is 84% of the trucking ton miles are made up of these hedged and traded commodities. Trucking is extremely integral to the industry and to the economy. And what's more, the, 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 the companies, the shippers, the, the uh, AB InBevs of the world and, and the Procter & Gamble's, Nestle's, ConAgra's, et cetera, uh, or they're hedging and they're also saying that one of their largest risks to their profitability is their truck pricing which is highly, highly volatile, and they don't have a way to de-risk that. Transportation is also the largest mode of transportation in the United States. It's not rail, it's truckload. It's also growing faster than the GDP. Uh, highly, highly integral to our economy as the largest mode of transportation. Transportation costs represent about 8% of the U.S. GDP and is one of the largest cogs or cost of goods sold in many sectors, larger than energy. 40% of the S&P 500 state that their freight transportation costs are the most substantial risks to their earnings. Highly, highly integral and a high need to be able to de-risk this highly volatile, high cost, large cost. This graph is from our, this chart I should say, is from our, our sonar platform, freight markets uh, platform. And it shows you uh, the freight rate index between Los Angeles and Dallas from 2014 through 2018. And what you're seeing is from the lows in 2014 to the highs in 2018, 136 percent growth in price, in cost, transportation costs. More importantly, in between, you see these huge peaks and valleys and ups and downs throughout, upwards higher than 62 percent, over 62 percent upswings and downswings in route to this 136 percent growth. At the end, you can see this huge drop off that's occurring in the pricing highly, highly volatile, even over a four-year growth period. What causes this volatility? Virtually anything that happens causes volatility in transportation, it seems. Government regulation, obviously, the OPEC moment for us, or in, that, in, the, in, in the transportation industry would be the ELD mandate, going from paper logs to electronic logs. Reduced efficiencies, which then reduces capacities, large fluctuations in the pricing, large contract uh, increase on, on contract pricing between shipper and carriers at the beginning of the year, followed by downturns this year. Hurricanes, FEMA, pre-hurricane, sucks up capacity, tightening the market, driving up rates, it ripples through the other markets, and then when it's over, it dumps all this excess capacity, which kills those, those rates and drops those rates in specific markets. Again, it, it fluctuates. The different seasonalities across the United States, fairly consistent, but they happen in different times. 2017, the rains in California came. They are a little heavy. Produce was late. Friends in the southeast wondering why on the planet that they could not get a truckload from Atlanta to Dallas for less than five grand <clears throat> for a period of a month or better. Huge swings in, 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 in uh, truckload pricing caused by these things. Obviously, construction activity and manufacturing activity, et cetera, but not only on a macro level but on a micro level as well in specific markets when there's uh, specific industry that has large pushes, it will 
speed up the capacity and drive up prices in specific markets or on specific lanes as well. So it's not just macro, it's across the board even in micro markets. And it occurs from week to week. So if we have this massive market that is integral to industry and to our economy, it's highly, highly volatile. And you have this huge demand from really the three players, the shippers, manufacturers, carriers, and the intermediaries to be able to de-risk uh, this, this volatile price movements. Why now? Well, the ubiquity of, of telematics. Now we've had uh, devices to show us where trucks are and where, where uh, uh, capacity is moving or where loads are moving for, for some time, but the proliferation of, of, of cell phones has given us even better and more real-time data as to where those drivers are and what that pricing is and the load accepts and rejects, et cetera, et cetera, to give us real-time data. Cloud versus on-premise, Computing, from the largest to the smallest, this move to cloud-based computing allows for real-time upload of real-time data that is then discoverable through these interconnected systems and mobile devices. The market forces, talked about ELD, the OPEC moment for the industry, moving from paper logs, no more two logs, which one do I need to show the officer today in order to keep myself moving and be efficient to the ELD. Labor shortages, the Amazon impact. Amazon created something for us that we didn't know we needed and need to have that freight today in two hours, next day. You can't sit on your loads and make sure that you have full capacity on those loads when you've got pressure like this knocking on your door. It moves less freight on truck, less revenue on the truck, less efficient, less capacity, higher costs. And of course, capacity crunch. So who's naturally exposed to the freight market volatility? First of all, before I go any further, with freight futures contracts, no truck will ever show up. They are completely they're financially settled. You cannot take delivery of the capacity. The pricing contracts and the securement of outsourced capacity by shippers, by 3PLs, these move along in their physical market just like they do now. These are hedging instruments for them, financially settled instruments. So trucking companies, 4,500 plus companies with $20 million or more in revenue per year. Trucking companies, trunking, trucking companies make their revenues when pricing goes up, and they need to protect themselves for when it goes down, those downswings, right? They have their windfalls up. They have their moments when they drop, like now, where their profits are being squeezed, their margins are being squeezed, and throughout that growth, from 2014 to 2018, 136% growth, yay for the carriers. Lost their butts over and over again on that ride because of the volatility up and down. Shippers, which are not carriers, shippers, manufacturers, those shipping the goods. 20,000 that spend over $10 million or more on transportation costs, on trucking freight per year. They want to see those prices low. And so at the time the carriers are getting crushed, the shippers are popping champagne corks and vice versa. Now over the last year, I had many a colleague calling me worried about their jobs and some of them looking for jobs. That huge spike that we saw in 2018 cost a lot of people a lot of jobs. True story, a colleague of mine, George Abernathy, our chief revenue officer at Freight Waves and I were calling on a large retailer in the United States, worldwide retailer, on uh, the day they announced their earnings. And the whole place, huge, 10, 20 floors, couple buildings, celebrating these earnings reports. 
except their transportation department. Their transportation department was hunkered down with George and I in a room about this size with close to this many people talking about freight futures and sonar and how they were going to be able to enjoy this celebration the next time it came around because they got their butts kicked even with those earnings reports. Freight brokers. Freight brokers are really both sides of the equation. They can be long or short. They're signing contracts with shippers agreeing to, sh to move their freight at a specific rate and then they're going out to market to secure that capacity in order to move, the, to move that freight. They're also playing the spot market in many cases. <clears throat> they can benefit both ways. They also have their margins compressed in both ways. And a little uh, later on, uh, Mr. Kyle Lintner will be talking about that from pay ratio a little bit further. So what do you need for a liquid market? We talked about a massive volatile market. Truckload is the largest. It is as integral, if not more integral, to our economy and to industry. And it is more volatile than the pricing in oil and natural gas and electricity. You have to have a, a benchmark index. Our partners at DAT are the, bar, are the benchmark index. They are the plats of spot market pricing, if you will. 700 plus sources, 256 million electronic transactions annually measured, better than $60 billion in freight transactions, well over half of the spot market is uh, the size of their, their, their data for their, for their benchmark index. And nodal exchange, leader in energy markets. Have been with us since the beginning building this market from the ground up, an integral part of, of making this happen. It was a perfect marriage, maybe the only perfect marriage, but a perfect marriage because trucking and, and, and power or electricity are very, very similar. They're both finite, they're both perishable, they move along grids, and the volatility can be regionalized and is regionalized. There are about 40 billion plus miles traveled in a spot market across the United States in a year. The contracts are $1,000 or 1,000 mile contracts to which equates to about 40 million futures contracts that could be traded in this market. Large, large market. I'm going to bring up uh, Danny Gomez from Nodal Exchange to talk. Um, you have questions, I'm sure you do. Um, we did this at the last road show and it worked very, very well as, as at the end we just kind of brought everybody back up here and had a panel question and answer at the end. So we'll, we'll, we'll work with that format again. So with that, Danny. Thanks, sir. How's it going? I'm Danny Gomez. <clears throat> um, so I'm part of Nodal Exchange. So in this partnership, um, you kind of go back a couple slides. Um, you know, one. You look at this slide and you see all the different pieces that are integral um, to launching this market. Um, you know, these three partners, we couldn't do it without each other, right? Freight Waves provides the insight and the expertise and the knowledge into the, into the industry. They know what the, what the participants need, they know who the participants are, they know how we should evolve the contract offering over time and what to launch with to begin with. Uh, DAT provides a reliable, robust, index to settle the contracts to, something that everyone can trust. Um, Nodal Exchange is providing an exchange, liquidity, risk management. So all of these are necessary. And why the opportunity was good, you know, we saw very attractive, was again, the large market, the volatility, the lack of risk management tools, and the natural buyers and sellers in the market, right? There was people already in the marketplace who could come to the table day one and use this product. So that was really attractive. Um, you know, moving forward, what we want to do today is really introduce people to the contract to understand why it's useful to them, but also who we are in this whole process. Um, so again, I'm Danny Gomez. I started with Null Exchange in 2008, helped launch the exchange, and then later the clearinghouse. 
with me today is Dimitri Carusos. He's our chief risk officer, um, and uh, you have like four more other titles. I don't really know what they are. But um, and then in the back we have Kristen and Perva who are with us as well. So afterwards, if you have questions um, when we're having a cocktail, you can ask any of us. Um, so nodal exchange is a futures exchange. Um, it's regulated by the CFTC. Um, the benefit of having an exchange allows um, you know. A, a trustworthy, reliable place for people to come transact, and it provides liquidity to the market. So um, in, in this exchange setup, what we have is we have an exchange and then an associated clearinghouse. So the clearinghouse, um, in, a, in addition to the exchange providing liquidity and transaction and you know, other ancillary services, the clearinghouse provides risk management tools. And what it provides together as a whole um, is more opportunities for people to trade their contracts and assurances that um, you're going to get performance on the contract that you trade. So historically, um, you may think of uh, bilateral markets or spot markets, if you're familiar with those types of transactions, where you're dealing directly with counterparty. And so you're exposed to that counterparty risk. And it limits you to who you can do transactions with. But if you have a cleared exchange, um, the exchange in the clearinghouse is the, is the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer. And so um, we're protecting the market from, um, from each other, really, or from um, people not being performant on their obligations. And so uh, this provides not only liquidity, but also efficiency um, to the marketplace as a whole um, and provides a robustness in terms of uh, performance on the, on the hedges or, the, or these, you know, the, maybe the speculative trades that you put on. Um, another integral part to this whole process is the FCMs. So if you're not super familiar with futures exchanges and clearinghouses, um, in order to be a participant on nodal exchange or to trade the futures contracts, you'll become a direct participant of the exchange. But in addition to doing that, you'll have a clearing account with the, what is termed an FCM. The FCM was actually going to, you know, talk to the people who are interested in trading um, the futures contracts, and they're going to understand, you know, why you have a business need for doing this or what are your interests in doing this. And they're, at the end of the day, what they're really going to do is, you know, guarantee the performance of your trades. So in the event that you can't perform on your trades, um, one of these FCMs that, you, that you'll have a clearing account through will come in and provide safeguard to the market. And so there's many layers of protection in these cleared markets. We're lucky today to have Dave Satello from ADM. Um, he's in the back. If you have questions about um, clearing accounts or gaining clearing accounts or what that process looks like, I'm sure he'll be happy to talk to you. Um, he supports our market today in, on the energy side. And, um, they are, are obviously interested in the freight futures as well. Um, and when you think of transacting um, on futures exchanges, um, there's, there's many different methods. So um, Nodal Exchange recently launched uh, what we call a T7 matching engine. When we were launched back in 2009, we were founded by uh, market participants. Um, in 2015, we launched our clearinghouse, and then in 2017, we were purchased by Deutsche or EX Group, which is owned by Deutsche Vorsa. Um, so that meant we became part of a much larger exchange family. And part of that acquisition, we got access to T7, which is um, a very robust, robust matching engine, the same matching engine that um, exchanges like Eurex and EEX Group uh, use today. So that launched in November of 2018. And so that technology allows us to provide to the market an electronic trading platform. And so this is the back end that matches all the orders. Um, the interface to the, to the what they call the order book is a is trading platform or trading platforms. Um, we partnered with CQG to make sure that we had a trading platform um, day one. And so they've been a great partner in launching not only access to our energy business, but also for um, trucking freight futures. And so this provides a place for people to come post electronic bids and offers directly to the marketplace, and that's visible. You can see how deep the market is, how many buys, how many sells, and that's a transparent way to view the market. In addition, if you're not familiar with how futures are traded, there's uh, a term called block trade. Block trades are um, quote unquote off exchange. They actually come to the exchange, they're cleared, but they're, they're not done in the central limit order book. Um, they're done through either voice brokers. So the term broker, this is different than the three PLs or the freight brokers. These are OTC brokers who are matching buyers and sellers. They're taking no principal risk. They are just matching up transactions, and once they find the buyer and the seller, they submit to that, that to the exchange for clearing. 
Um, in addition to having the ability to go through voice brokers, you can also go direct through with, with other counterparties. So it may be the case that you're willing to buy and then you directly deal with another company that you know who's interested in selling that features and you can match up directly, negotiate the deal and submit it to us for clearing. So there's still block trades but they're just done direct bilateral. They're not done um, through the voice broker. Um, and then in addition, you know, part, um, when Craig came to us a couple of years ago and talking about freight futures, um, I think he wanted to launch the contract the next day, right? Um, it's obviously a process to get um, contracts launched, but in the time that he's done it, he's, they have managed to launch two really good businesses, which is Freight Waves and Sonar. Sonar is a data platform, so when they looked at the marketplace and thought about how futures would trade in, in freight, they realized that there was um, an opportunity to provide a data platform to give people more anal analytic tools to trade the futures around and to really to operate their, 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 their freight business in, in general. And so uh, Freight Waves has built Sonar, it's a, pla a data platform. Um, we're, we'll be feeding data back into Sonar, um, you know, future price curves, um, potentially transaction data so people understand where it's transacting. Um, and then you can also access nodal exchanges, CQG platform through Sonar. It will, it, will, it will take you into our platform so that way, you know, if you're analyzing data, you can also go into the nodal exchange hosted platform. Um, and so you know, this is a very high level view of how um, you become a member of an exchange, who the parties are, where you, what types of accounts you need to gain, how you'll execute. Um, you know, after we'll have a QA and a we're happy to answer any questions also in the cocktail hour. Um, we're going to move forward and then have Tom, I believe Tom Allen, talk about the contract specifically. Thank you, Danny. Uh, my name is Tom Mallon. Uh, I am the Vice President of Financial Markets and Trucking Freight Futures at Freight Waves, and I want to take you through uh, some of the highlights of the uh, futures contracts. So what you see on the screen is our uh, Trucking Freight Futures network. Uh, we work very closely with Nodal uh, and DAT in identifying uh, the lanes uh, where futures contracts would be, uh, would be listed. Um, through our work with DAT, and DAT, as, as Michael alluded to, um, they do a huge amount of, uh, of assessing. Um, they assess about 18,000 or so origin destination pairs on a daily basis, and from those 18,000 origin destination pairs, uh, we narrowed the lane selection for futures uh, to seven lanes across six cities, um, and then from those seven lanes, uh, we will create uh, three regional averages and a national average, so up to 11 contracts uh, will be listed for trading and clearing on the nodal exchange. So in the west, we have the round trip lanes, uh, Seattle to Los Angeles, Los Angeles back to Seattle, and from that we will create uh, the west uh, regional basket. In the south, we have LA to Dallas, Dallas, Dallas back to LA, um, and that would comprise the southern uh, regional average. And then in the east, we have the triangle, Chicago to Atlanta, Atlanta to Philadelphia, Philadelphia back to Chicago, um, and that would comprise the eastern average. And from those three regional, we will also have a national average. Um, the rationale behind selecting these lanes um, are that um, these seven lanes uh, correlate uh, directly to about 23% of all freight being moved um, on those lanes, uh, with a national correlation of about 84%. So highly correlative uh, to the national freight markets. Uh, the contracts themselves, these are monthly contracts. Um, they will be listed 16 months out. Um, they are dollars and cents per mile. The standard unit is 1,000 miles, so that is, that, that, is the, uh, that is the size of the contract. Uh, there will be a daily settlement um, as calculated by the nodal exchange. The monthly settlement will consist of the average of the daily settlements as produced by DAT. So it'll be a monthly average of the daily settlements uh, from DAT. The contracts themselves, they're based on dry van. Um, they are line haul rate only. So these are spot rate contracts. 
And by line haul, I mean there is no accessorial uh, charges included, nor is there any fuel uh, associated with the rate. So it, it, it is the rate that it costs to move a truck uh, from the dock along these lanes. And as I said, uh, the, the series is 16 months out. And just a little bit uh, more about DAT. Um, they are the ones who have created the methodology um, around uh, the data collection. As Michael alluded to, um, they collect about 256 million uh, data points, um, which comprises about 60 billion in freight transactions. Now what I want to do is uh, give you just a, a little illustration of how trucking freight futures uh, could trade. Danny alluded to the fact that uh, through our sonar market data platform, there will be a link to uh, nodal CQG instance, so you'll be able to trade through sonar um, the trucking freight uh, contracts. What I've done here is I pulled up our sonar uh, 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 platform. Um, here is a chart of the, uh, the national uh, van rate index as produced by DAT. If I go to my pages, I will kick off the trading simulation. And this simulator is here. It, this is just for illustrative purposes. Um, this is not uh, Nodal's CQG instance. Uh, but I did want to give you a flavor for uh, what it would be like to execute trades through Sonar. So in the top, up here in the top, uh, you'll see account information. This is the information that's set up by your FCM. Um, and it'll give you your account balance. Um, it'll give you uh, position information. Um, and it'll give you um, your P a real-time view into your P&L. In the middle section is the trading instruments uh, that would be available. In this uh, scenario, we've got basically four contracts available. So we've got the national average as well as the three regionals. And in over here uh, to the left is your trading information and your order book. Um, so uh, you can enter in uh, orders. In, in this situation, I'm going to take the view of a shipper. Um, today, uh, a, a shipper is naturally uh, short capacity, meaning that they would want to be long in the futures market. So in this scenario, I'm going to select um, a, the February contract. Actually, it's the May contract. I'll go to the February contract. Um, and if, as a shipper, since I am short capacity, I want to buy futures. So what I would do is go to market and let's say I've got 20,000 miles of freight that I need to move. I would, as, as these are 1,000 mile contracts, I would want to buy 20 contracts. Submit my order and into the market. It's executed. You'll see my position is updated down below. Um, I am now long 20 futures contracts. As I am beginning to move my freight, um, and again, you know, I lock these in because rates for a shipper are, are low, so I want to protect myself as a shipper uh, and buy the futures contract. So as my freight begins to, uh, to, to move, I'm going to go back into the market, and I'm, gonna want, I'm going to want to unwind my position. So I would go back into the market. I would place an order. And in this scenario, I'm now going to sell. 20 futures contracts or 20,000 miles uh, of, of, of freight futures. I sold the contracts. You see my position updates down below. I am now flat and I have unwound my, my hedge. And that is a quick demonstration of trading capabilities in sonar. And now I'm going to turn over uh, the, uh, the presentation to Kyle Lintner from K-Ratio. Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Lintner, and I am a principal at a firm called K-Ratio. We are an NFA member firm, CFTC registered CTA. For those of you not familiar with the acronyms, it simply means that we are legally allowed to provide advice, consultative services, and risk management related to futures trading. 
with that in mind, I thought I'd walk you through how some of this stuff might look. Specifically, we're talking about missed earnings. It's 40% of S&P 500 companies cited transportation costs as the number one driver behind decreased profitability. That is a large amount. These losses are not isolated to quarterly or annual lookings. This is something that moves forward with you. If you pay more for your transportation costs, you will lower your stock value. That's if you're public. If you're private, we're talking about a lower EBITDA. You can take that against your industry multiple. It's compounded and it lowers your enterprise value. It's estimated that five to 14% of cost of goods sold are directly related to transportation expense. That is a large amount. What does this look like? We're talking about taking a variable cost to a fixed cost from a shipper's perspective. We're trying to er eliminate the volatility, provide guidance going forward, and effectively lock in the rate of what you will pay going forward. In 2018, from January to end of year, freight rates were up over 30%. Contained within that 30% are upwards of 62% swings in volatility. Those are large, large numbers for anyone to try and deal with, let alone pay for. Specifically looking at this, this is the national US van average. We see the peaks, we see the valleys, we see the extreme peak in June and July. We also see where we're at now. This is the ideal time for a shipper to lock in rates. You are now looking at prices you have not seen since, since 2017. For a carrier, same mentality, same fiduciary responsibility, except we're talking revenue instead of costs. We're trying to know what we're getting for the trucks. We're trying to lock in what we're gonna get for those trucks. It allows you to plan your business. It allows you to take in your expected revenue for your business. Pretty straight, straightforward stuff. Same chart, same perspective, except completely mirrored. We see the peak in June and July. If this tool had been around, conceivably, you were able to lock in those rates instead of getting the $1.47 that you're getting now. This, to me, is where it gets a little bit fun. Lots of people ask where the broker or the 3PL exists in this marketplace going forward. It's our opinion that they will have a fixed operational and fixed carrier expense position. This is something that not only allows them to remain competitive, but uh, truthfully, it, it's something that will be required to remain competitive, and it becomes a competitive advantage. How does it look? Long and short. Yes, I know the obvious question, how can I be long and short? Wouldn't that make me delta neutral? The answer is no. We're talking about two separate products. Delta neutral, yes. Gamma neutral, no. The most obvious one, revenue hedge. If you are a brokerage or a 3PL, similar to the carrier, you'd like to lock in your expected revenues. You all know what you're gonna get roughly going forward, whether it's in spot or contract business. This allows you the tool to lock in that 209 instead of sitting down here at $1.40. The tricky part to it is the less macro, more micro level, the expense hedge. If you are a 3PL, with high probability, odds are you are sourcing capacity on a spot basis. You have your contract business, that is your revenue, your expense is truck capacity. When you go out and source it, you're buying spot market rates. Until you do that, you are naked and unhedged in the marketplace. You take a specific lane, and however that correlates to your business, this example is LA to Dallas. Similar types of volatility, we see a one peak, a valley, and then the extreme peak in October of the year. Present value down around 140. Conceivably, you could go forward, locked in at $1.40 on this LA to Dallas. It allows you to be more competitive for 2019. Additionally, this allows you to be more competitive in 2020 when RFP season comes around again. You can now price lower than what your competitors do lock in those effective rates, shift the risk, premi risk premium that you're already placing in your RFP and move it into the futures exchange. This is exactly what this tool is meant to do. These are not gains, we're trying to mitigate losses. Some of these topics I understand are a little complicated. I will be around after the show, as will be my partner Patrick. K-Ray Show, just to remind you, is the financial services division of a 22-year-old asset and brokerage called k &L Freight Management. Personally, I have over 20 years experience in the futures markets, uh, the last 15 or so, trading my personal accounts in commodities, stocks, options, currencies, bonds, 
uh, you name it. Uh, outside of myself, we do have a rocket scientist and NASA engineer, plenty of statisticians and data nerds. Apologies to data nerds in the room. Uh, you can visit our website or see me during reception for any questions that you may have. With that, I'd like to open it up to Q&A. That is a Danny or Tom uh, or a dad. We'll take a Tony. Yeah, so uh, Tony Salazar with DAT. Um, so the, the day, daily settlements are calculated uh, based on you know the seven lanes um, that we described. We, we basically are pulling it from our commercial product with rate view um, and we scrub it down to just be the essence of the line haul rate. So we're removing accessorials, hazmat, um, you know, and, and then we have a statistical uh, process we put on top of it to ensure that we don't have an overweight of any one contributor into that lane, and then that becomes the basis for the uh, for the rate. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Um, so it's actually for the day. Uh, we use it's it's a five uh, it's a five day lag, um, and so you know basically to, uh, today we would publish the rate for last Tuesday. Um, and, and we do that in order to make sure that we have sufficient uh, um, records into, in the lane, make sure that we have enough uh, to make it statistically significant, and then also to uh, avoid any overweighting. So it is a, it's an average of those lanes that's, um, that's handled in a way to make sure that no one contributor can do more than 49% of the, of the particular rate. Yes. Yeah. Excuse me. Can you can you elaborate more on that? Because, so first of all, you're going to post five days afterwards. Do you think that could be a problem for market participants, not knowing where that index is now moving along day by day? And secondly, is it market capitalized weighted or is it price weighted? Um, so what I say when I ask that question. Right. Um, Obviously, LA to um, Seattle be more, might be more important than Philadelphia to Chicago. Yeah, so, so each of the, first of all, let, I'll let probably Dimitri answer the first question. And the second question, that they're individual lane rates. Uh, and so there'll be seven indexes that are indices that represent those individual lanes. So those are unique and are determined by the records actually, you know, of, the, of what moved in those lanes. Um, the, the, uh, the regional averages and the national averages are straight averages of it. I don't know if that answers. Of each of those lanes, yes. So it's not, it's not weighted, it's just straight up. Perfect, and then just to distinguish between the settlement index, which is what Tony was just referring to, which is what the contracts will ultimately settle to, versus the daily futures pricing, right? So the daily futures pricing, which happens every day. In fact, we produce uh, two sets of settlement prices twice a day. So that will be priced on what the, act, what the futures trading activity is, plus any other intelligence we are able to gather. So if there are orders on the screen that don't execute or any broker activity or anything we can, we can gather to get a sense of where the futures prices are moving. That's separate and distinct from where five days ago the spot market settled, which is what the settlement index is for, if that makes sense, right? So ultimately, you're trading monthly futures contracts. So today, you'd be trading September 2019, let's say. Um, so we will be pricing September 2019 as a futures contract like we do all our other futures contracts. When it comes to the end of September, we then have that series of daily um, spot prices for the month of September that we settle against. To start with, no, we're going to start with uh, monthly futures contracts. Yeah. Does that make sense? Did that? Okay. And yeah. Privately? So, so right now, there's not a whole lot of um, swap trading occurring in, in, in the market. So we are, this is really the, the, the country's first attempt to have fixed price trading that's truly guaranteed fixed price trading in the trucking space. Uh, 
can you talk a little bit more about position limits that you'll be implementing, uh, you know, kind of last three days into trading? Are you going to have any kind of position limits or spot monthly limits on that side? Sure. So um, the way position limits are set, um, uh, the exchange does what's called a deliverable supply analysis. Um, and it's not, th I think three days is, is a common NYMEX um, issue because these contracts will be trading throughout the current month. So we were just talking about September 2019. The whole month of September 2019 will be the spot month. So it won't just refer to the, th the three days you're thinking about for a prop month contract that's about to expire. So for a, a contract that actually trades into that spot month, that whole month will be considered the, s the current month or the spot month. And so our position limits, traditionally the CFTC, um, you know, absent any other logic, likes to use a quarter of deliverable supply as the notion of how much they're comfortable with having one party have um, a share of. And so we'll be setting the position limits to 25% uh, of that deliverable supply. I think that analysis just is just wrapping up. So as soon as it's ready, it'll be published as part of the contract specs. Price limits, me, price meaning how much it can go up and down. Excuse me. Just trading halt. We at Nodal right now, given so so Nodal's um, existing marketplace is power, and we found it um, counterproductive um, to have um, pr um, price limits. Um, if you lived through the um, the polar vortex of 2014 that actually became problematic at other exchanges that were under that regime because they, they didn't allow participants to trade the, the market price, right? So um, we won't have price up, price down limits. Now, if we, uh, um, w as an exchange, we're in charge of surveillance of the market, and if we see obvious manipulative behavior, then we'll, you know, we'll have to put something in place. But to start off with, we won't have um, price up, price, price down limits. Sure. You've obviously made reference to electricity being highly volatile and this market being very volatile as well. Uh, until the crypto market, electricity is probably the most volatile commodity in the history of the world. Vo and volatility futures, I'd argue. Yeah, volatility yeah. futures and electricity, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, so that being said, has there been any lessons learned that we can apply to this marketplace about the extreme volatility that was experienced in electricity over the years? Yeah. So. Um, the, the reason we felt comfortable listing these c contracts and why I think um, Freight Waves felt comfortable working with us is that we have a risk model um, that is designed around that kind of risky um, contract. So I think Danny made reference to the FCMs, the clearing members. These are the credit intermediaries that each participant will trade through. Um, they have faith in our risk model because they're ultimately guaranteeing all of the traders' performance, right? So um, we use a VAR-based model um, to manage the risk, but rather than uh, kind of a traditional VAR model, value at risk model, that relies on a measure of standard deviation, if you're familiar with, with traditional models, um, we use a version called expected shortfall, also called conditional VAR. And so what that does is it specifically looks at the tail risk of the historic profit and losses of, of the contracts. And that um, very much focuses on that on that tail risk, obviously. So it ignores if, if there's a lot of you know days that go by without a lot of volatility, that has no impact on the credit requirements for the um, for the contracts. So it very much um, focuses on that worst one percent uh, of observations. So you do a, a true intent stress test. Yeah, and on top of that, that's right. On top of uh, on top of making sure that the um, the data the risk model has those stress scenarios. Um, in the history and that the model relies on those stress events for determining the, the hold, we then do additional stress scenarios for what's called the guarantee fund um, to make sure that the, the whole market is protected. Has, has options been discussed? Is this going to be in the future? Oh. Um, right now we are listing futures um, down the road. Depending on customer uh, input, um, we could list options on the futures.
Really quick, anecdotally, uh, day one when it launches, do you see most people taking it to the screen or doing block off like OTC transactions? Do you guys have market makers already kind of signed up to start putting liquidity on the screen? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a really good question. We're in conversations now with uh, liquidity providers, so we do intend to have liquidity providers uh, making two-way markets on the screen. Um, as far as you know, where trading uh, will uh, be derived from, we see it a combination of both the screen and also block trading. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for, uh, for listening to us. And um, we're going to have a, a, a cocktail reception. We're all here and are happy to answer any additional questions you guys might have. So thank you very much for coming.